not, I just don't want to use the word conservative over and over and over again. So I just think it's more interesting. So that out of the way, here we go. So on Friday, May 8th, 2015, Britain woke to the Tory majority government. It's not what anyone, members and apparatchiks of the Conservative Party included, thought was going to happen. The polls all told us going in that it was neck and neck between Labour and the Tories, with a hung parliament a near certainty. Constituency polling seemed to back this up, telling us that Labour would lose many seats in Scotland to the Scottish National Party, but that they would gain many more to the Tories in England, the result of which would be a parliament in which either Labour or the Tories could be the largest party. Uh, most wisdom seemed to come down to the Tories just slightly tipping ahead of them at, uh, with a late surge towards them. A common Westminster wisdom said that the Liberal Democrats would have enough going for them with an incumbency factor in the seats already held. The experts on such things expected about half the seats won in 2010 uh, general election, which would be around 28 to be uh, retained by the party. This would possibly put the, the Lib Dems into a position of kingmaker as they were after 2010. Instead, the Lib Dems lost 48 seats to be reduced to a mere eight MPs. The Scottish National Party almost completely wiped out them in their Scottish heartland, producing them for 41 MPs to a single seat. Ed Balls, the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, lost his own seat in what became one of Labour's worst general election defeats in their entire history. So now we are left with England with a large Conservative majority, uh, while Scotland has 95% of its seats taken up by nationalists. The union, which has lasted over 300 years, has never looked so imperiled. So with that in mind, what is the future of British politics? And indeed, British political parties, uh, the, the after this election result, the likes of which no one predicted. Both are obviously intertwined, so I'll begin with what the political party should, and more pertinently will, at least in my opinion, do in the near future. And hopefully that will shed some light on the next five, the next five years. The United Kingdom looks like. So I will start with the vanquished. Uh, Labour suffered their worst electoral performance in a general election since 1987, and in many ways 87 was actually better for them, because at least they went into that election with no real expectation of victory. Uh, they expected to lose to Thatcher, and at the very least 87 was an improvement on 1983, which was actually Labour's worst ever performance. Uh, you have to look at 2015, and in the run-up, right until polling day, Labour thought they had a real possibility of being back in power, even if it was through minority or coalition arrangement. And so to have lost all of Scotland's uh, traditional heartland, for Douglas Alexander, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, to have lost his seat, and Ed Balls, before I mentioned, Shadow Chancellor, to have lost his seat as well, and for the Tories to have got a majority against all expectation, Labour obviously in a position of existential crisis. How Labour responds to this defeat will tell you a lot about the direction of the entire country, at least politically, over the next decade. There is a battle on at present for where Labour goes, which direction they go. It is shaped up, as many might have predicted, as a battle between the trade unionists and the sort of the Blairite centrists, for lack of a better word, although they probably wouldn't use the word Blairite to self-define. Uh, so what that may basically amounts to is a possible shift further to the left, embracing more protectionist economic policies, as well as very possibly even a socially conservative one, if they are going to try and win back UKIP and formerly core voters in the north. Uh, this position is represented by the co-frontrunner for the leadership, Andy Burnham, uh, which I should mention, this is despite him having actually been a minister in Blair's cabinet for a period. Uh, but the union seem to have sort of coronated him as their de facto uh, candidate. On the other hand, they could send, uh, move more to the center, away from, uh, at least more centrist from where they were under Miliband. Um, and that position is going to be represented by Liz Kendall pretty much solely now, uh, given there, was more, there, was, there were more prominent centrist candidates in the mix, uh, most notably Chuck Omuna, who sadly decided to drop out of the leadership race early on. Uh, now, in my opinion, it's the centrist route is the only one that Labour can possibly go down and have any chance of winning the next general election. And even then, it will be pretty tough for them. Uh, some of the sophology around it is pretty daunting from a Labour perspective. And even given all that, early signs from the Labour Party on this front are not good. Given most of the Labour membership are well to the left of even most Labour voters, I expect the Labour Party to probably elect Andy Burnham as leader and head even more in a more left-wing uh, direction than even under Ed Miliband. 
And as I said, I think this could spell a catastrophe for them, the left center of Britain, and indeed, to some extent, everyone who would count themselves as a non-conservative within the country. As for the Liberal Democrats, rebuilding from such a low base under first past the post presents enormous challenges. Like what Labour is facing, the Lib Dems too will face an internal battle about the direction of the party from here. Some will want the party to remain centrist and focus on those things that differentiate the party most from the, the Conservatives. So being liberal in the social sphere, championing li civil liberties, which will almost certainly come under attack during this parliament, and obviously being a proud pro-European voice. However, others would like the party to be more of a sort of far left party, uh, sort of like the Greens, but just with slightly more parliamentary representation. Uh, I remain hopeful that the former will win out with it, at least giving the Lib Dems a chance to win some of the seats lost at the 2015 general election. But again, like I say, all victories will be extremely difficult. Uh, I think Tim Farron will be the next leader. It's looking very much like that. I think that many people will assume as a result that the party will head in a left-wing direction. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, we'll wait to be, we'll wait to see. Um, <laughs> one final note on the eight seats as well. It's unfortunately very geographically spread out across the country. If you look at the Dems seats, it sort of looks like someone sneezed over a map of Britain. We've got one in <laughs> Wales, one in uh, the south of London, one in Scotland. It's so there's no sort of cohesion to it at all, which is an added headache to the whole thing. Uh, a quick word about UKIP, which, while I'm covering the defeated, uh, one of the few silver linings for Liberals uh, on May 7th was the failure of UKIP to meaningfully break through. They ended up with one seat, which is actually one fewer than they went into polling day with. Um, however, it has to be said on the flip side, four million people voted UKIP. And if they don't fall apart over the next couple of years, they could use their 120 odd second place finishes, particularly in northern English cities, to transform themselves into a real political force capable of winning uh, at other than the European Parliament polls, which Britons tend to use as a protest vote. Uh, a word of warning to the UK, the United Kingdom Independence Party, and Nigel Farage in particular, is that far right parties in Britain tend to have very short lifespans and can be uh, somewhat you know, easily killed in a short period of time. It's notable that the British National Party got 564,000 votes at the 2010 general election, and in 2015 they got 1,667. So <laughs> things can fall apart very quickly for, uh, for, those on, uh, for, for extremist parties, actually, generally, in Britain. And early signs from UKIP don't vote particularly well. They've sort of uh, devolved into a sort of civil war. Uh, Nigel Farage promised to step down his leadership he failed to win the seat he was contesting at the general election, which he did not. Uh, he resigned and then unresigned very shortly afterwards. Uh, this will hurt his man of, of, of the word of reputation. Farage's uh, image is very much built on, you know, he does what he says. And so having uh, sort of unreservedly said he would quit and then unquitting will definitely have, have its consequences, and also clashes already taking place between Farage and Douglas Carswell, UKIP's sole member of parliament. And to add to this, Douglas is very much at odds with most of the party's membership, being a pro-immigration libertarian. So uh, UKIP could easily rip themselves apart in the coming months. However, if they don't, I think uh, they do have a future as a sort of English nationalist party, uh, which could actually have a, unfortunately, from a liberal perspective, actually have a, uh, a catchment area, particularly in the north of England. So right, now we're on to the winner of the 2015 general election, uh, the Conservative Party. Um, having just been through the immense problems that, that, uh, that Labour, UKIP, and Lib Dems, their, all their main electoral rivals face in the years ahead, this should on paper pave the way for the Tories to dominate the electoral landscape for the next decade, maybe even decade and a half. However, they face huge problems themselves. With a razor-thin majority and the need to call a referendum on the future of Britain's membership of the European Union, keeping his parts together will be a real challenge for David Cameron in the years to come. The Prime Minister has indicated through his past, past behaviour that he's willing to do almost anything to avoid a split in the party. Uh, this, after all, seemed the motivation for making the EU referendum pledge in the first place. So the question has to be asked is what does he do when a significant number of his back, his right-wing backbenchers uh, decide they want to campaign against him? i.e. campaign against staying in the EU. Thus far, Cameron has talked a big game about whipping the party to support whatever his post-renegotiation position is, but this is hard to see playing out in reality. The 
the backbenchers of the Conservative Party are simply too Eurosceptic, and many of them want out at all costs. So you'll notice that I have made an assumption here that David Cameron will campaign for Britain to remain in the European Union, and there are several reasons for this which I'll go over. Um, I think it would be very difficult for Cameron to back the get out vote in the referendum, and most of the early signs seem to confirm this to me. The fact that he's already essentially laid out what his renegotiation looks like, and the fact that he wants to have the vote sooner rather than later, uh, confirms a lot of suspicions on him backing a stay-in vote. Uh, the renegotiation package, I'm sure he's discussed at uh, different levels. It seems like he has an idea of what's reasonably attainable. And it appears to revolve around five major themes. Uh, Britain being able to opt out of an ever closer union, uh, denial of EU migrants, any benefits including uh, in-work ones until they have lived in the country for a certain period of time, giving greater powers to national parliaments to block EU legislation, so more powers to a red card system or however that might evolve, uh, protecting the City of London from a host of EU financial regulation, and finally creating safeguards so that Eurozone countries cannot impose changes to the single market on non-Eurozone countries. So essentially, the idea of the two-speed uh, two Europe, if you like, being sort of somehow uh, set in, in stone, although not treaty change, because obviously it's what he's trying to avoid given the timescales. So when you think about that list, it, you'll notice it's obviously fairly ambitious. And that's what could make Cameron's dual ambition to hold the referendum sooner rather than later very difficult. The Prime Minister wants to hold it relatively early in Parliament because it would theoretically give stay in the best chance of winning. I mean, the thinking behind that is that the Tory government would not have become unduly popular yet. Uh, again, so the theory goes. And also from Cameron's perspective, if the Conservative Party is going to have an internal fight on the subject of the European Union, he'd rather get that done and out of the way as quickly as possible so that any reconciliation with party can be complete while well, the parliament is reasonably young. But really there are two big reasons why I can't see Cameron ever supporting a get out uh, vote in the EU referendum. And the first one is that to do so would be hugely alienating to uh, a, a huge portion of the business community in Britain. The Tories can't ever risk such a relationship because if Labour picks, goes against predictions for instance and picks a centrist leader next time around, uh, there could be trouble if the business community feels uh, alienated. Uh, also, uh, a lot of donors to the Conservative Party come from the business community, as you'd imagine, and the support, tax or otherwise, is hugely important to the whole Tory brand. The second reason is Cameron arguing directly for Brexit would place them on the opposite of the argument to the Americans. Uh, the Conservative Party remains very Atlanticist, and the so-called special relationship is something they take very seriously. The Americans are extremely serious about wanting Britain to remain in the EU. First of all, it's because they they have some they see themselves as uh, the Britain is sort of being an interlocutor with a lot of the EU. But also, and this is much more important, they feel if Britain leaving would possibly weaken the entire European project, and the continuation of which is very much in America's long-term interests. Um, America wouldn't would be a bit peeved for Britain to endanger the entire post-Second World War European settlement over a fit of peak within the British Conservative Party. I should touch here on where the European debate is in Britain at the moment more generally. I think that the tone of the discussion around the EU and Britain is something that often does shock our continental cousins. Most of it is heavily Eurosceptic, and usually based on facile concepts such as the EU costs money and is therefore bad, uh, with no look whatsoever about the benefits Britain derives from being part of the largest single market in the world, or dwells on more embarrassing alternatives, and I'll put that in quotation, such as substituting the Commonwealth for the European Union as a trading bloc. Uh, the fact that none of the Commonwealth nations have any interest in such arrangement, incidentally, has not deterred any admirers from advocating this form of silliness. And I should mention that I think this will come up in the EU referendum debate. Uh, I would expect Cameron to call on people like Stephen Harper, uh, possibly Tony Abbott, if the you know, Canadian Australian Prime Ministers, to talk about that in more detail to sort of say actually you have know, to realise that you know Canada and Australia are very interested in their own things. Thank you very much. Not hanging around waiting for the Empire to get back <laughs> together. Um, so I think that will be spelled out, and I think that actually will be quite powerful to a British audience who remain sort of blissfully unaware of some of that. So how exactly will the EU referendum play out then? I, I'll start by saying that I think Britain will vote to stay in. 
uh, when they are offered to them, and I'll work backwards from there. And I'll preface by saying that obviously nothing I'll say about that should make pro-European Britons complacent. Uh, one assumes that Labour Party will campaign to stay in the European Union, but I should mention that it's by no means a given. It does depend on who becomes the next leader of the party, because there is a strong strain of, of strong anti-EU feeling on the left in Britain, as there is in many uh, European countries. One only has to recall the last referendum Britain had on Europe in 1975, when the Labour Party membership wanted withdrawal by a margin of 2 to 1. However, I still think Labour will campaign to stay in Europe regardless in the end. Mostly because to do so otherwise would risk another of their heartlands falling, namely London, and having already lost Scotland, I don't think they're going to be in the mood to gamble with another. Uh, at the end, Cameron will present his renegotiation package, package, whatever it is, as a huge triumph. I think that will be welcomed by both the right and left press, uh, for different reasons, obviously. And I think the British public, largely ignorant of how the EU works, will pretty much accept it at face value. That's what I anticipate happening. Uh, many of his backbenchers then, and we'll wait to see how many, in course with UKIP will declare the whole referendum in the terms that it's being fought under. It will be called a stitch-up, and there'll be uh, allusions to 1975. Um, but like I say, I think we will vote to stay in. What then happens to the Conservative Party will be interesting, post-referendum. I think possibilities range from everybody keeps their discipline, there's a few minor you know, fallouts, uh, but everything just kind of bumps along, to the Conservative Party splits in two. Those are the, sort of, the two uh, absolute extremes. Uh, and there's clearly a, a huge amount of stake for Cameron in all this. As I say, he's already made noises about that he wants to whip the collective position within Europe, uh, within the party, but I don't see how this will hold. Uh, and a, a split would be interesting, but I don't think it's probably going to happen. Obviously, if it did, it would be a huge uh, opening for the Liberal Democrats, potentially, but that would really depend on where the Lib Dems were, um, how things proceeded under the new leader, and obviously what the polling position of the Liberal Democrats at that, position, at that point was. So I'll put aside the question of Europe and look at how, um, more broadly, the politics of the next five years in Britain will play out, in my opinion. In terms of economic policy, we're looking at major public sector cuts under the Conservatives. Uh, they pledged to cut the deficit by a large amount, and also to do so without uh, raising taxation. In fact, they're going to be lowering taxation in many instances. Uh, a lot of, uh, they're just going to be lowering taxation in a lot of ways. So add to this the fact that a lot of the savings made in the last parliament of the coalition were, sub a lot of them were efficiency based, that's all been done. So the cuts that will have to be made now will all be front line ones that the public will directly feel. Um, it will be interesting to see how the pinch of that will be felt and if the Tories will, will suffer in any way politically for that. They obviously don't have the Lib Dems to hide behind this time. The political plane, if there is something to be had, will be all theirs. The Conservatives also want to uh, put into legislation a great deal of things that the Lib Dems prevented them from doing in the last Parliament, such as a greater rollback of civil liberties in the form of the Snoopers Charter. There's talk of a repeal of the Human Rights Act. Um, however, like on Europe, I think Cameron can expect to face some battles within his own party on these matters. There is a liberal wing of the Conservative Party that will not take kindly to actions that involves what is technically more government intrusion into the system, into their, the lives of the citizens. Uh, well, at least that's how we argue by the liberal wing of the Conservative Party. Again, with such a narrow majority, it won't take very many Tory rebels to make such things impossible to get through the House and into statute. The Conservatives also seem to be looking to tell some old scores. There is some talk of punitive action towards the BBC. And already Cameron has specifically identified decriminalizing the non-payment of the uh, license fee, which pretty much amounts to the Prime Minister inviting the citizens of the country not to pay for public television at all. It'll be interesting to see how that goes down. And there is talk of even breaking up the BBC. Again, we'll just wait to see how far the Tories go on all of this, how much of it's rhetoric and how much of it actually uh, gets put into action. And one has to remember that the Tories didn't expect to win, so some of this might have been gambits uh, for renegotiation, even negotiation with the Liberal Democrats, should that situation arise. Given that it's now all in a manifesto, <laughs> it will be interesting to see how that then plays out. Um, so yes, then there's a strain of Toryism which, uh, which is very much centered on preservation of uh, beloved institutions, which of course the BBC is one. Moving on to the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists hold 56 out of Scotland's 59 seats. Uh, and Cameron will meanwhile then have to hold the country together, quite literally, as a result. 
A game will soon emerge between the Conservatives and the SNP, both of them political offsets on paper, but both with similar motives which bind them. Uh, they both have a common enemy in the Labour Party. The Tories would like to see England get more power, decide more laws within that country itself, without the Scottish and Welsh votes weighing in. And meanwhile, the SNP would obviously like more devolution, so they to dovetail quite nicely. The Conservatives would simply, uh, one theory goes the Tories could simply call the SNP's bluff uh, and sort of go, well, here, take it all, take, uh, we'll just devolve everything to you. Um, with the idea being that essentially the SNP like to play this game of being in opposition and power at the same time, where if you devolved everything to the Scottish level, they couldn't do that anymore. But one has to wonder why the Tories would bother, because what, what motive do they have for, make, for making the SNP look bad? As long as the SNP can continue to take all the seats in Scotland, it very much prevents us a Labour majority any time in the near future. So, so again, there's a sort of uh, a synergy between, between them there. So in summation, uh, David Cameron has, has his hands full, basically. Mm -hmm. I need to keep the country together, to keep it in the EU, or at very least the single market. The desire to make spending cuts on what would most likely, or very probably, be a very unprecedented level. And he has to do all this with a tiny parliamentary majority of 12. Uh, the Conservative government will face many challenges. However, if the Labour Party continues to self-destruct, both the Prime Minister and his party may just be al uh, allowed to get away with it um, and return to government after the next election, regardless of any failures made in this parliament. And I'll close by saying that Despite having some real concerns about the next five years and what sections of the Conservative Party might have up their sleeve, I remain a balance of optimistic and worrisome about the state of Britain over the next five years. I think that the rebellions we spoke about earlier within the Tory ranks on issues like the Human Rights Act and Civil Liberties will come to pass, and I think a lot of that legislation will fail. I think as Liberals we should feel good about that. On the other hand, I think public services could be in bad shape and cuts could affect education, whatever the Tories have said about ring fencing these certain areas. So I have concerns about that. So basically there will be pluses and minuses. I do hope that the economy will continue to grow. I think it probably will. I think as a result the country's uh, financial position should be better overall. Um, and finally, one thing we can all hope for is that when the next general election comes around, uh, the pollsters will be able to give us a bit more of an accurate idea of what it all looks like and save us pundits making terrible predictions which are totally erroneous next time around. Thank you very much. Optimistic and worrisome. <laughs> yes. Very fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to invite up um, the Swedish um, UK based community. We have three experts on UK politics who are invited tonight. Uh, Charles Sandvik, political scientist from the University of Sheffield, welcome up. Stefan Sonny, chief correspondent in London, on Swedish radio. And Maria Borelius, uh, board member of Open Europe, uh, entrepreneur and columnist in Dogs in the Sea. To what extent? Do you agree or disagree um, with Nick's statements about the current affairs of UK politics? Do you have some interesting observations, um, points of agreement or disagreement? I, abs I absolutely agree with, with uh, Nick's uh, evaluations on the drama uh, on, the, on the 7th and the 8th of May. For us as journalists, it was, it was the equivalent of, of Santa Claus <laughs> that arrived at noon, 10 o'clock p.m. and 10 o'clock 30 seconds p.m. when everything was turned upside down. A very, very strange experience, very lovely experience for a journalist, of course. And big news happening in real time, couldn't be better. Um, uh, so that's, that's where I think we uh, uh, agree. I must say, just a reflection, yeah. that I had sort of uh, taken some proportions because in all my stories on it's very, very difficult to poll in, in the first part of all systems. Yes. Uh, but I could never have dreamt of something like this mm. because it was 92 again, yes. but worse. Oh, worse, yeah. And they should have heard something. 
Yeah, I thought. But also after '92, we all took, we all figured they they sorted it all out, and the polls must be right. Yes. They must be right. Even people like myself who really anticipated not a Tory majority, but the Tories definitely being the biggest party and getting close, rolled back from that as as election day came closer and said, "Woo, well maybe it'll be Labour." Because we just thought, well, if the Tories haven't moved ahead now, when will they? Yeah. And then it turned out they were yeah. completely wrong. <laughs> and one question, perhaps, that I would like you to elaborate on, mm -hmm. if yeah. you touched upon it, yeah. and it's the uh, evolution. Yes. The evolution to Scotland, to Northern Ireland, mm. to Wales, and, mind you, to England. Yes. Which is, uh, I guess you all know about this, it's a bit strange. Mm. Scotland, they got a local government, Wales got a uh, local government, Northern yeah. Ireland, got no uh, local government, England has no local yep. government. So the Cameron wants to create some sort of double layer MP parliament. Yes. Well, Even voting rights. What would, <laughs> what would that mean for 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 United Kingdom? Ah, oh, well, devolution in the United Kingdom. This is a very complex topic. Um, uh, as they were basically, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales all have devolved legislatures, England does not. Um, this has always created what's been known as the West Lothian question, which is why, if Scotland has a devolved parliament, so they have their own making West, which just decides certain things which are devolved to Scotland, and keep in mind nothing's devolved to England, why do Scottish and Welsh MPs get to vote on issues which pertain only to England? And the thing is, no matter what, you've had some of the best political scientists and the best brains in Britain thinking about this for four decades, and no one's come up with anything even remotely useful, essentially. Uh, <laughs> because the, well, the problem is, as soon as you get English votes for English laws, what you're then essentially doing is, is you're segregating. You're, you, you're essentially, you're, you, you're putting the union in great peril because essentially you're saying, well, the Scottish MPs, you only matter for Scottish uh, issues, to which we say, well, we already have a devolved parliament, so what's the point of being the national legislature? Um, which is why the problem is it's one of those horrible situations where everybody's right and everybody's wrong at exactly the same time. So what the solution is, I, I wish I had a solution. I wish, so it would have been great money if I had some brilliant solution to the West Lothian question, but unfortunately I, I don't. I mean, I am starting to warm up a little bit to the idea of an English Parliament, actually. However, I the separate, the separate, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have to say though that that is extremely unpopular, generally speaking, and it's very unlikely to happen because. There's a, the campaign for an English Parliament has basically taken over by the far right. So this is very much, any time you talk about it, it's seen in very nationalistic terms. So that has tainted it as well, apart from any logistical problems it might have. So, so, so I think it probably, I mean, we'll see. Given that we've got a Tory majority in England and the SNP in Scotland, maybe that will force something through. I think that's a real possibility. Can I just add on the, yeah. I don't know if this is on the same thing. Um, in terms of devolution in, in England, mm. uh, a sort of maybe more useful way to look at it is in terms of north and south divides in yeah. England, uh, because all the sort of um, well, very negative feelings around the election and around mm. the election results uh, comes from this kind of north and south split. Yes. Um, so it would probably be quite useful in terms of strengthening democracy to actually have more decentralised government rather than talking yes. about English devolution as such. There's even been a I mean, it's a bit silly, but there's been sort of um, petitions now for Northern England to join Scotland because yes, the, the, yes. The, the same sentiments <laughs> that are in Scotland yeah. are in, in the north of England. So, well, certainly feel closer to Scotland than yeah, London. Yeah. And what, adding to the problems is London is quite it, it is quite devolved in itself. There's a London Assembly. London has a mayor, for instance. So London's kind of a special case in a way that, for instance, Manchester isn't or Chester isn't. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, this is the problem that you get when you do devolution piecemeal. When you don't do it all at once, and you just do it bit by bit, obviously there's going to be a situation where there's, un, there's, there's an unfair balance, and then evening that out becomes tricky. Um, I just wanted to bring us back a little bit to the topic of the day, which is the Liberal, the liberal yep. Party. Excuse my voice, it's been very hoarse since the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite a good term, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting, the party went from 23% of the vote to 8% of the vote. That's a drastic uh, loss. Uh, and I'm three quarters Swedish and I'm a quarter British, and practically all my relatives vote for the Liberal uh, Lib Dems. Uh, and I would say that they range politically 
from in the Swedish context, from you could say almost Vänsterpartiet to right-wing Folkpartiet. In terms of their, and that's a huge spread. Yeah. Uh, in terms of their view of the market economy, some are pro, some are against. Mm -hmm. In terms of their views of social liberties, some are very much uh, traditional, some are very sort of modernistic. In terms of individual liberties, it's a huge spread. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think, what is this party mm -hmm. all about? What is the story? What is the narrative? I mean, in the election. Uh, you know, that's the big question, because in the election, Nick Clegg, I think, faced some difficulties in terms of sort of presenting his ideology. He's, he basically made a tactical argument. He said that we know that there is going to be a coalition, because Labour cannot win themselves, and the Conservatives cannot either. They could, yeah. but we didn't yeah. understand that. So it's going to be a coalition, and we will be part of it. So he said, with us, with the Conservatives, we will give the Conservatives a heart, and we will give Labour a brain, which I thought was quite clever. But I mean, it's not much of a story, is it? And it didn't work. It didn't so, work. so <laughs> <laughs> we can say it definitively. Yeah. So, so you know, how do you see as 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 a key player in the party? Because you got the group around the orange book, yep. which the Nick Clegg group, which is a very you could say almost like the Swedish folk party yet. Uh, is, you know, what, what's going to be the story forward? Well, that's a good question. I mean, one of the problems is who becomes the next leader. And you've got eight MPs who are, again, a very disparate bunch of um, people. You know, you've got some very left-wing people there. You've got some people who are very much of that orange book tradition. I mean, I think that, I obviously, I mean, I, I'm an orange book liberal, so I would obviously say that the way forward is, you know, keep, keep the orange book traditions alive and uh, all that kind of stuff. I mean. It'd be interesting to see a lot of people who joined the Lib Dems since polling day. I mean, I think it's like 15,000 or something now. And it's be very interesting to see where they fit on the spectrum. But I think one thing you're absolutely right about is the Lib Dems need a story that is entirely individual. I think trying to sort of split the difference, as it were, which happened this election. Trying to say, as you say, the, we can give this party this, this party this. Or, or talking about coalitions, and coalitions we have found, you know, aren't popular. People don't like coalitions. I mean, one of the arguments against the alternative vote in 2011 was all they had to say is this will lead to more coalitions. People don't yeah. want that. Don't want that. But, but I think, think people want strong government, it's called. Yeah, yeah, but I think we have to say also yeah. that nobody believed in this coalition. Everybody mm. thought it would fail, and it actually worked very well for mm. five years. And it brought down the deficit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, did huge reforms in terms of schools, in yep. terms of welfare, mm -hmm. improved the situation for the people of the lowest income. Yep. So it was actually in many ways, a, a, you know, a hard working coalition. I think a lot of people, had they had the chance, would have voted for the coalition to continue. I think lots of people would have, but the point is that that wasn't on the ballot paper. No one could vote for that. And so what they said is, well, they made a very logical position which you have to do under first past the post, which is, okay, well, I'd prefer to have Tory live again, that would be great, but what I definitely don't want is Labour, and the only way to ensure that we don't get Labour is to vote for the Tories, and that's what people did, <laughs> just by and large, I think. And I think a lot of people in the Southwest sort of did this thing of going, well, if people vote Lib Dem, well, I could probably vote Lib Dem. I'll vote Tory, though, just to be safe. And then everybody did that. <laughs> and then they went, oh, Okay, that's the Lib Dems gone. Oh dear. <laughs> Wasn't there also a large proportion yeah. of, of tactical voting? Oh, I, yes. I read the Daily Mail, yeah. two days in a row, they yeah. had the whole front page and a couple of mm -hmm. news pages yeah. on 50 constituencies yeah. where you should tact vote tactically. You do get, this is what I would say about that, you do get a lot of that before every British election, because under first past the post, obviously, tactical voting can be quite key. I would, I would warn against that because one of the things is usually tactical voting, when you say a lot of tactical voting is going on, usually people tactically vote against the Tories. That is a tradition in Britain. You know, so, so people go, like Lib Dems got a lot of that. People said, oh, I don't want a Tory MP here. I, I do like Labour, but they have no shot, so what I do is I vote Lib Dem. Um, so actually people voting tactically for the Tories is unusual. I think probably a lot of people were pushed to tactically vote and didn't. I think how they voted was, there was a lot of fear. There was, I think people felt like, 
Millerand's going to be a terrible prime minister. If he's a prime, if he's the prime minister, the country's going down the pan. It's going to be terrible. I better vote Tory just to make sure that that can't happen. I mean, I think I think that was a huge. That was that was the driving force behind it. I think. But that leads leads yes. to the question on the voting system. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> I can perfectly well understand that you yeah. make this kind of pissed. Yeah. Yeah. They got 12 or 13 percent of of the uh, votes. Yes. Yeah. Four million votes. I Four million and one one seat. seat. And they went into election with two. Yes. <laughs> and but the S and P on the other hand. Yeah. They got around four percent. Yeah. Of the vote. And 56, 56. seats. Yeah. This is absurd. Yes. Well, yes. Just, you can't vote for the S and P unless you're in Scotland. So, I mean, there were yeah. people in England who asked, "Can we vote for the S and P?" Yeah. So yes, yeah. they could have gone more. Yeah. My question is: yeah. Yeah. Will the discussion uh, start again? You had a referendum in 2011. Yeah. The alternative system. Yeah. Um, will it start again? No. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, first of all, you have a Tory government for. Not well, you yeah, have for the next five years at least. Um, or they could repeal the fixed term parliament act and have it earlier and somehow lose, it's very unlikely. But let's just say for five years. So it won't happen at any time then. The Tories are absolutely against any change to, I mean, any sort of constitutional change, even if it's really logical. You know, like, well, let's ban people from the house. Let's say people from the house lords have to retire if they murder somebody. <laughs> so, I mean, the idea they're never going to be for changing the voting system. So that is a huge stop. But I think also one of the problems with changing the voting system that you have now is you'll have people even on the left who, who might be inclined towards uh, electoral reform go, let's stop and think about this. You know, had we had a proportional system at this election, we would have a Tory UKIP government now. That's what we'd have. UKIP would have 100 seats, whatever it is. Uh, the, the, the system uh, saved us from UKIP. Uh, and there will be a lot of that argument going around. There will, there will be a, it will be a prominent argument, I think. I think, uh, looking mm. all over Europe, what's happening, we had the Spanish elections yeah. yesterday with uh, uh, sort of the moderate conservatives losing ground to a new populist party. We had in Poland the elections with, with a more conservative uh, leader coming. You know, we're seeing all over Europe kind of pushing to the extremes. Uh, we're seeing, instead of only the left-right angle mm. of politics, we now have a sort of modernizing and traditionalist angle which plays out more and more. And I, I think, in a way, the UK voting system is a wonderful balancing mechanism. It's not fair, but it's balancing. And I find, as a Swede, I don't know what, what you guys think, but when I meet British MPs, uh, whispering softly, they are much better than Swedish MPs. Because you've got to win on your own an entire constituency. You cannot hide behind a party list. Everyone in that constituency knows who you are. And that brings out a lot of really talented people. Um, so I'm not so sure that long term this is a bad system. You know, it's brought out some of the world's best parliamentarians, Gladstone, mm -hmm. Churchill, Blair, Thatcher. I mean, that's a pretty impressive list. I mean, I'd say PR has its pluses and minuses, so does First Past the Post. I mean, I think First Past the Post has all those things that you describe. I think probably the downside to First Past the Post is you do end up with a lot of safe states, which is slightly problematic. So you get things like people parachuted into, you often get it in these labor seats where someone who's never been north of Watford gets to be MP for, you know, Doncaster. It's slightly ridiculous. But just because they're a wonk that they want to have in and they know there's no way they're going to lose the seat. So, but having said that, I think... But I, Ten times as much of that is... Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have, you have pluses and minuses. I think you're probably right. I mean, I, I, I have to say, I probably did wake up. <laughs> Even as a Lib Dem, where we'd been unfair, you know, we'd been done over by the system, I did think, Tory UKIP. That would have been fair. You know, that would have been like, I'm moving. <laughs> I'm leaving the country, that's it. So, um, so yeah. So there is uh, this alternative system that you had a referendum on. Yeah. Um, <coughs> 2011. 11, yeah. Where, where if your candidate number one yeah. is gone, number two gets your vote. I mean, AB, then you keep, then you keep the local connection. I mean, AB would have been. I, I think AB probably would have been an improvement personally. Uh, looking, but having said that, it's not coming back. I mean, we voted it down. I mean, uh, no one's going to push for it ever again because people who don't want to let. Are going to put, be 
are going to be pushing for no change. People who want change will be the PR people. So, unfortunately, I think AB is consigned to history as a possible alternative British uh, electoral system at Westminster level. It's a shame the way it came about, though, because it was so yeah. rushed. And it was clear that Libyans put all the eggs in, in the yes. empty basket and, yes, uh, and, and to keep the coalition. And that's what we mentioned before, that um, they they talk so much about and try to keep the coalition together because um, that's the only way they would ever be in government. And, and it didn't work. It didn't then work. it's kind of difficult to see what the alternative is because they were yeah. never... They, they have to promote the idea of a coalition, and yeah. they did, and they kind of did it successfully, but it doesn't matter. Well, I think that's, not, that's the heartbreaking thing for the Lib Dems, is the Lib Dems stayed, basically the Lib Dem, the, the, the Clay project was you stay with government for five years, you show that you can be responsible, you show that you can do the job, you make the thing work, and hopefully you'll be somewhat rewarded by the electorate at the end of it, and then obviously that was completely not the case. I mean, that's, that's what we, we saw on May 7th. But I, I think also, I agree totally with you, but it's important to um, add the name Linton Crosby to the equation. Mm -hmm. So this is an Aussie guy, a hardcore, uh, knuckle-fighting uh, party strategist from Australia who had been working for uh, Prime Minister Howard before, mm -hmm. and then he came in and ran the two campaigns for Boris Johnson, the very charismatic mayor, the guy with the blonde mop, uh, you saw him in the other game, <laughs> and the very... Uh, Unironed uh, suits. He's very likely to be the next prime minister. Yeah, the very likely. Yeah, I think he will be after the election. But anyhow, Linton Crosby made, uh, you know, did a very strategic analysis and saw of the map of England that the constituencies where it was easiest for the Tories mm. to uh, gain more seats mm. were where the Lib Dems had fought um, a very victorious campaign under Lord Reynolds' strategy. Yeah. The, the campaign strategies, which was basically, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. focused around a lot of local issues. Very localist, I mean, uh, basically, for, for a part West, yeah, exactly. Cornwall, Cornwall. Yeah. Basically, uh, she's referring to Lord Renard, Chris Renard, who was the um, party chief, he was never an MP, he was party chief executive for uh, a crucial period of time, and he had what was um, colorfully described as a decapitation strategy. And what this was is in the 90s, the Tory vote was heading southward. We, we saw that in the result of the 1997 election, where Labour ended up with a 170 seat majority, which is huge. I mean, under the British system, that's, that's epic. Uh, and what the Liberal Democrats, what Renard realized was there's a whole bunch of seats in certain parts of the country where Labour are not going to win. The Labour, and it doesn't matter how much the, the Tory vote depresses, they'll never win. So what we do is we put all our eggs into those baskets. So there's about 60 seats that he recognized, mostly in the southwest of England, where they had been liberal seats in the past, and they had a, a, a sort of a liberal tradition. And that if they were targeted, particularly at these Tories who were unpopular, and those particular, and there were particular ones who'd been caught up in scandals, there was, the Tories were a real mess in the, uh, in the 90s, that they could gain a bunch of these seats, and true enough, that's exactly what happened. The party went from about 20 seats, I believe, in 92 to 46 in 97. Uh, again, almost all of the gains taken from the Conservative Party. Um, and so the Tories have been successively trying to get these back at a, every subsequent election, and failing for the most part. They didn't actually do that in 2010. There was actually a lot of seats that went back to the Tories. However, they, if you're looking at it, you sort of go, well, how many Labour seats can we get? Tricky. How many, you know, Scotland, Scottish seats, that's not going to happen. If you were a strategist and you were looking at what are the most gettable seats, they would be those Lib seats in South Wales, which obviously turned out to be precisely true. And that was hugely targeted local campaign. Yeah. You could even target individual voters. 42 year old women with kids in school, she would care about, you know, local yeah. NHS, local schools, and they could target information. And they would, I mean, yeah. Hugely, hugely targeted, hugely targeted, which was novel at the time. A lot of parties have taken it on. And the one of the things that Lib Dems love to do is, you know, our candidate is local. Look, there's be a map, right? Our candidate was born here and went to school here, and then there'll be some map of Britain with the because one of the targeting was people who'd been parachuted into there. You know, this person grew up in London. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> this sort of, you know, we're hyper local. We, 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 you know, we pick only we we pick people locally because we care about you and your issues and what's important to you. These people don't care about that at all. Um, so that that was that was very much the Lib Dem kind of um, 
strategy. Nick and uh, also the commentators. I would like to, to pick some questions from the audience, but before that, I would like to pick up on a theme that sort of started off, but, but we didn't really follow through with. That's something that, that we discussed before the seminar tonight. It, despite the past differences in UK and, and Swedish politics, there are a couple of themes that seem to be recurring. The, the increasing strategy, strategic steps of yeah. political uh, elections, uh, decreasing ideological confusion mm -hmm. say, across the political spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and also the, the divisions in terms of, of regions wanting to have more local power, yeah. but at the same time the European Union is not really gaining in popularity. We can see that in Sweden, we can see it in the UK, we can see it in many other countries. So, so um, perhaps we could reflect upon that and, and uh, think about what would that tell for, for uh, European politics? Mm -hmm. um, Overall, and perhaps specifically Swedish and, and British politics, you know, confused ideologies, mm. increasing um, voters going from different different parties. Yeah. Um, so there are more UK type of parties coming. I mean, that would be interesting because I think what the the UK thing in Britain is certainly, and if you look at some far right parties in Europe, this definitely follows suit. Is uh, you know, a lot of it's a reaction to globalism, and that is one of the reasons why the EU is so easily targeted, because the EU is, is there's an obvious um, correlation to a lot of people between EU and globalization, you know, just becoming a more, uh, just a more globalized world, a more open world, a less national-based world. And the people who feel like they're losing out because of that, whether rightly or wrongly, they react against it, particularly when no one else is, is giving them any solutions to the problems that they're facing. So, you know, um, the, the, you, you've got the huge sections of, you, let's say you've got, you've got towns in England which where unemployment's massive, uh, living conditions really bad, poverty very high, and you've essentially got the Tories going, well, you're all lazy, so why don't you just go get a job or leave? And then, or, or then you've got Labour saying, well, we'll keep you on the dole forever and ever. Um, and you can come along and say, we can make your lives magically better, all we have to do is leave the stupid European Union. And they go, ah, oh, that sounds great. So, I mean, how you combat that? Well, I think you combat that with better communication to <laughs> the segments of the population. I, you know, I, that's my personal view. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's just about communication, though, because there aren't really dire yes. situations. Yes, oh, yeah, no, 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 um, and actual policy yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, no, of course. Uh, but I think it's interesting in the UK as well, because there is like, an, it, was, it was so pronounced, I think, in this election, not just the anti sort of globalization uh, and anti immigration, but also the sort of identity politics in general. Because you had, I mean, there was one particular um, leader debate, which was all the uh, all the opposition yeah. parties, uh, and there you had um, uh, what's she called, Jan Wood from, from yeah. the Welsh Party, um, and you had Nigel Farage and Nicola Sturgeon, uh, and they all kept saying over and over again in the debate that what we want was best for the Scottish people, was best for the uh, for the Welsh and for the British, although they really kind of meant English. They kind of meant English, didn't they, yeah. Um, and you only had the Green Party and Labour stood there actually speaking for some sort of common good yeah. or or some sort of uh, yeah. ideology. Uh, and I think if you take that coupled mm. with a very, very negative um, mm. election, it changes quite a lot, I think, of how politics is run, how you yeah. do politics and not in a very good direction. Uh, and maybe that's where this kind of ideological confusion comes from as well, because it, that's not really what's a focus anymore. Mm -hmm. It's focused on what's best for me and my group, uh, kind of taking over slightly. Yes. Um, which is kind of a sad development, I think. I agree, yeah. I mean, I think the SNP vote was actually quite came down to something quite simple, which was people sitting there going, well, I'm gonna get this Labour guy, he's not gonna do anything for me. Uh, this SNP person is only gonna care about Scotland and what's good for my well, I'll have a look at that. So selfish voters and selfish politicians. It's not really selfish, I think, because yeah. you always have people voting for their interests, yeah. but their interest has been more maybe as a working class person or yeah. as something else, and now it's selfish in terms of my identity group, which is slightly different. Yeah. I mean there was an interesting there's been people doing interesting research on Scottish nationalism and people claiming that Actually, if you look at how people identify, they don't actually identify more as Scottish um, rather than British. <coughs> now, actually, less so. Um, so, but but that's not really the point in how it's been played out. It's not necessarily how who who am I, uh, but but how can I get the best for mm. for my little for my group that I'm already yeah. uh, already part of. 
So stop on Maria. Well, in, in the future, we have identity politics. What yeah, do you think? I think so. I think we have a huge collapse both on left and right in terms of delivering stories that answer worries that normal people have about their lives. Uh, the traditional left-wing story has collapsed. It doesn't work. It has been translated into a tax and spend story, and, and that's not enough. Uh, the, planned, the dream of the planned economy and how that would bring about a common good would, has been shown not to work. So, uh, and I think what we saw on, on the conservative side was a very sort of boring, uh, smorgasbord of, okay, we will give you this, we will give you that, we will, you know, no overarching story on how normal, aspirational people who want to get on with their lives, try to do the best they can, can actually achieve that. And I think that is a huge challenge for both the left and the right. That story about how to promote in each society aspiration, that is that everyone, in each situation, you have two choices with your life, do your best or not do your best, how to always promote the person who tries the best, maybe doesn't have all the resources, but tries the best all the time. And I think we need to look in, in new ways of taxing the super wealthy and lowering taxes for the aspirational. So, so translating taxes between wealth and work, for instance. And I know the Lib Dems did a great job on that uh, in this government, and I know that George Osborne was sympathetic to some of that. Yep. So that, that's one of the type of things, and I think Labour has lost the plot. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, and yeah. probably, just as you say, going to draw the wrong conclusions of, of the loss, which Tony Blair has pointed out. Yeah, I mean, you can see it already, they, they've gone into a space. I mean, the fact that Burnham's the, the central candidate, which I need to point out, you came fourth in 2010, why Burnham's gone suddenly being fourth to... It, it, it's, not a, it's not a compelling story, as to be said. Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, I would say that when you see all of Europe, uh, is that, that people are sort of centered out from the center towards the periphery. Uh, and it can be left, it can be right, but they're centered out from, uh, from, the, from the center. And the most interesting example right now, I think, is Greece, where the far left Syriza joined forces and went into a coalition government with a very strange or right yeah. and populist party. Mm -hmm. So Greece, once again, mm -hmm. is a very good example <laughs> yes. of something that is very strange. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, um, it is interesting, just to offer the cause on that, is, is how in Britain we had, you know, the parliament seemed to be dominated by outside voices, as you say. We heard so much about UKIP, we heard everything. And in the end, what we ended up with was a, a sort of majority. <laughs> But it's interesting how these things play out. So now we have a knowledgeable and very interested audience here. So uh, I would like to take the opportunity to ask if there are any questions for you to anyone or all of the panelists. And I will give you the microphone to ask that question. Elaborate more on your speculations for Boris Johnson's future, sure. for his future career. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Boris has been sidelined for the time being because obviously he. Uh, what, what was the anticipation was possibly um, to keep in mind Boris has just got back into Parliament. It's a lot. I won't go over the ins and outs of Boris's entire career, but he was an MP for a period of time. Left Parliament, became Mayor of London, and he's just become uh, MP for Uxbridge, which is very safe. Uh, Boris is sort of being looked upon as the favourite next uh, Conservative leader, and given two factors, one of which is uh, Cameron hinted for a while and then sort of became explicit about it during the campaign that he was going to step down at some point during this parliament, so, you know, 2018 or whatever, um, and so whoever was going to be the next leader would be it. Now, I, for a very long time, I had speculated that someone from the right Conservative Party would be the next leader, sort of an Owen Patterson, etc. I, I don't think that will be the case now. I think things have changed. The, the, the majority, this majority has changed a lot. And I think, so but that's what I think. But anyway. You're, you're, My guess, yeah. uh, for what it's worth, um, is that Cameron will lead uh, the EU referendum and step down after that. Yeah. And I think that would be an excellent timing. I think it depends on how early it is. How early it is, yeah. but. 
probably the party will be very divided, as you say, well, yeah. and you will need a new leader to kind of heal old wounds yes. and progress. And I think, and I know that they are already looking for new candidates for London Mayor. I bumped into a very good-looking guy at the gym, very muscular, <laughs> and um, he started hitting on me a little bit, and I'm 54 year old and kind of, I'm, I'm not in that game, I'm happily married. Uh, and he was talking to me, and then we started chatting, and, and I realized after a while I did recognize him. He's a very well-known football player, he's called Saul Campbell. Some of you might know he's played in the, yeah. Anyhow, he is one of the candidates to become London mayor. And uh, uh, so by coincidence, I sort of bumped into the, the process that's going through now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah, the, the Boris would be seen... Very nice guy. Yeah, Boris would be seen as a unifying candidate, someone who's wi widely popular, obviously was able to win in what is a, rightly seen as a Labour city. You know, he was able to win twice. So someone who could reach parts of the populace maybe that other candidates can. It really depends. One has to remember that who decides who's the leader of the Conservative Party or the Conservative Party members who tend to be much more right-wing than even your average Tory voter. So that's one caveat to keep in mind. Two questions. Is it I don't, I don't know at all. Hello. 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 Uh, two, two questions. One is, didn't the Liberal Democrats at all have a feeling that you know you might be doing much worse than the Poles? Because I, I, I in fact went and, and worked for an old friend who was running in St. Albans, and yeah, he did almost as bad as everybody else. <laughs> but he he was based, you know, he was privately saying that. He looked at the history, I and mean, the last time the Liberal Democrats got 7%, which yeah. was what they had in the opinion polls before the election, yeah. they got 60 Yes, that's right. But, but no, everyone seemed to think that they would get 30. Mm -hmm. and, and my, my, my second yeah. question is, is about the, the, the electoral system. That mm -hmm. I, I still think, I mean, there is, you, just because you have PR, you don't have to have such an extreme PR as you have in Sweden. No. I mean, in, in Scotland, I think they, you can have a majority of yeah. 40, 45 percent, which makes more sense. Because, yeah. because one observation I had was that isn't it impossible to have coalition governments with with uh, first past the post? Because I think if I read my if I remember my British history right, the yeah. Liberal Party has done that one, two or three times before and joined the Conservatives. Yeah. And then you had this, what you were saying, that you had to run as a coalition. Yeah. And that eventually meant that both the liberal unionists and the national liberals, they had to merge with the, with the conservatives. Yeah. Because in the long run, you can't have two parties that only run in some seats. Yeah. And this time, you tried to do the other thing, and both parties run in all seats. And that was also a complete disaster for the minor party. Yeah. So, so I don't really see how you, you know, how you can ever have a stable coalition with first past the post. Um, okay, well, I'll take those in succession. First of all, uh, why did the Lib Dems think they were going to do better? And why did the pundits, it's quite important to say this, why did the pundits? Yeah. So it wasn't exactly like the party was sitting there going, we're going to get 30 seats. And people like Peter Keller were going, you guys are mad. About. You're going to be decimated. I mean, everybody seemed to think it was serious. And the reason comes down to constituency polling. There was a raft of constituency polling that were done by all, uh, not all the companies, but there were a few. And Lord Ashcroft, who's a, he's a Tory guy, he does these, he did these um, rounds, both national polls and constituency polls. And they said that in places like, let's take, let's take an extreme example, Sutton and Cheam, um, which we ended up losing by about six or 7,000 votes. The final Ashcroft poll taken, I believe it was two weeks before polling day, put the Lib Dems 18 points up in that constituency. So there was a raft of constituency polls which said, and all these seats were, were not just up, it wasn't like it was, I mean there were some of them that were close, obviously some were up by one or two points, but there was a raft of them where the Lib Dems, Ashcroft was saying, you're up by 18, 20 points. And, and the Lib Dems were doing their own um, polling in these places, which was telling them pretty much the same thing. So you have a Tory donor over here, he's doing constituency polling, he says you're 18 points up, you do your own, it says you're 17. Generally speaking, you think, oh, we'll probably be okay. You know, to then not only lose that seat, but not even be close and lose it, yeah, in terms of defending it. 
what do you do? I mean, you know, you either sort of believe in the polling, you don't. But obviously, the polling was, for whatever reason, this time around, uh, extremely wrong. And then you had a question about um, coalitions. I mean, I think yeah, I think coalitions under first past the post. How, what, what do you do? I mean, I think that's a real existential question for the Liberal Democrats because how do you? What do you do? I mean, probably you, know, you have to look at is Labour, or more realistically, in terms of a party, is Labour going to self-destruct so badly? that somewhat there's a space to fill as the official opposition in 20 years' time. I mean, I, those are questions that are difficult to answer less than three weeks ago. How long ago was it? It was three weeks? It seems like about a year ago, so that's the problem. Uh, in terms of electoral systems, I mean, hey, I, I was for uh, the alternative vote. I mean, I think the mixed member system that you're talking about in Scotland would work perfectly well. I don't think the British people would have any problems with that. The problem is that uh, the AB referendum sort of killed it dead. You can always say, well, people voted against this. And what you can actually say is, whatever the reason, you can say people voted for first past the post. And whether that's true or not, that's a, that's a, you know, a statement that people often make. Um, so I just don't think that the voting system, for good or bad, is changing anytime. I just really would like to tell you something, and then we have time for two more questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um... In the last election, there were TV debates which ended up with everybody saying, I agree with Nick, that was Nick Clegg, the, the party leader, and I agree with this Nick a lot. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted, in terms of the EU, because I think we should bring that up, and um, the diplomatic way is saying, I'd, I'd like to clarify one thing, and that, in my view, yeah. and I'm on the board of a reformist think tank in, in the UK, yeah. which wants to stay in the U Union but reform it, in Sweden, it's very much a debate of in and out. Um, and the way uh, we would describe that is that that's a 1990s kind of debate. We are in the union that's already managed. Now, it's about what type of union are we in. Uh, and as every house needs, I don't know the English word for that, that you know, sometimes you just need a really good overhaul. It's a bit uncomfortable. That for everybody in the house, you need to go and shower somewhere else in the loo, but it's good for the house long term. I think EU needs a standard death. And, um, so I would say in England, you can be of three opinions. You can be an outist. No matter what the European looks like, you want to get out because you don't like to be with other people. Or you can be an inist. No matter what the European looks like, you are in it. And then you have the third camp that says, Let's stay in, but let's bloody reform it and modernize it. It's not reasonable that 80% of the EU budget is either agriculture subsidies or regional subsidiaries, which mainly go to rich countries. It's a weird construct. We should do more in some areas, less in some areas. Let's look at that. Let's use this opportunity with the potential Brexit and Brexit to do that. I mean, I'm probably Sorry, just, I you know, I'd probably just say in response. You don't so. even know what I'm talking about, some bit of it. <laughs> With the change the pipes and the drains and the lifts. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm all for EU reform. I think you're right. There's a lot of sort of silly things that go on there. Things need to be updated. I'm probably fine for that. I would only say that Britain can't possibly push for any of that if it's outside. I mean, uh, there was Owen Patterson said the other day. Oh, well, we'll just be part of the EEA and we'll be out and that will be better. And I just said, well, how the hell is that but better? But he's an artist. Well, of course he's an artist. Yeah, of course. What. But what I'm saying is I, that I don't... I just feel like we need to be in. That's what I feel. That's, that's my basic feeling of the EU. I wonder on, on that point, we view this on... Because um, Labour's position, I yeah. don't know if it was strategic, but during yeah. the Eurovision they announced that they're now in favour of an EU referendum as well. Uh -huh. um, I just, <laughs> <laughs> but the movie really says that they favour a referendum. I don't really know. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole anti Burnham, I guess, sort of. Movie. I just thought, I thought that was a bit like, personally, I just thought, okay, well, there's a Tory majority and it's obviously happening. So what? I know, I, but I, I, it, I, we're still against it. I mean, what? No, it made no sense at all. Yeah, yeah. But Andy Burnham's view on yeah. it has seems to be, he seems to want, a, like, a really, his reforms very yeah. much the same as Tories as well. Like, let's make sure that even when they not get any benefit. Actually, or, on that point, what he seems to be positioning himself, this is the strangeness of the um, of the Labour, where they sit right now, the silliness they're being involved in, is Burnham sits there and goes, how can I take a unique position on the EU? I'll be to the right of the Tories. Yeah, yeah. So he goes, well, I won't support David Cameron's uh, reforms unless they're really hard on immigrants, and they're really horrible, and they're just, okay. Uh, <laughs> Whatever you say, Andy. I mean, just completely off. 
Are you <laughs> it's burning them to stand up and go, sorry, this is far too generous to migrants and uh, people on welfare. Uh, the Labour Party will be campaigning to be out of the European Union on that basis. I mean, you'd just be like, S insanity reigns. I mean, that would be... <laughs> well, they're probably really, really scared of UKIP. Because yeah, I mean, well, UKIP's strategy, and, and, and I mean, you mentioned the BMP and the comparison, and I'm yeah. not sure if it's yeah. quite a comparison you can yeah. make. And, and they will say all the time, UKIP, that their strategy, strategy is 2020. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I don't know how well they'll do that. But Labour should be really, really scared. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Labour should definitely be scared. <laughs> you so, so, yeah, so they're trying to be, I don't know what yeah, yeah, to do, yeah. but more Tory, more UK. Clara, that brings up a uh, um, particular uh, question from me. So uh, now we're seeing uh, the Labour Party, or the, the mm -hmm. potential new Labour leader, you know, triangulate the UK policy potentially. Yes. And I think we've seen attempts at that in other uh, European nations. Yeah. To what extent could we see that, you know, uh, established parties could be, you know, pretending or actually coming closer in policy to xenophobic parties in a way to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, keep their, mm -hmm. their voters? Is that something you think we'll see more of? Happening. I think it's already happening. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, this election was just that. Uh, so I don't really understand why they're trying the same tactic again. That clearly failed. And I mean, there's some research that suggests that if you're not offering anything in terms of immigration that voters actually want, which is more restrictions, then you're not going to do that well. But all parties tried. I mean, even in Dems, I mean, they didn't really talk about immigration because mm. I think it was yeah. like we don't want to say what we actually think. No well, because I mean, it, was, it was not going to be a vote winner, so <laughs> it was not really. So, it's okay, so we're not all on one page all the time. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, in the UK you have seen a jobs miracle uh, the last, during this government. More jobs have been created in the UK than the rest of the European Union put together. So there is a job centre, mm -hmm. and that is attracting a lot of people from all over Europe, mm -hmm. which is fantastic in the sense that people can come and look for a new future. But we also have to understand that planning for schools, hospitals, transportation, uh, where people live, hasn't followed. So, and that affects normal poor people who live in the areas where these. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they are getting squeezed because in their kids' class, suddenly you have now 50 pupils on one teacher. And of course, they will ask, well, how is this all going to work out? Yeah. So I think that you, know, you don't have to be xenophobic to ask no. a, a, a reasonable question about the quality of, of public services. I just think the problem that Labour have is coming up with a coherent narrative sure. on this. Because yeah. basically, I mean, you, you can see a position where, okay, look, if you just want all the immigrants out, you vote UK. If, you, if you're if you basically a, a neoliberal, yeah. vote for the Tories, why the hell would I ever vote for Labour? I mean, I think that, that's the sure. issue for Labour. No, I agree with you totally. Yeah. but. Um, Talking about business and in yes. the EU to qualify yeah. Yeah. what you said, it is correct that the larger businesses, the large multinational banks like HSBC, yeah. uh, you know, the large Lloyds, etc., yeah. they are all pro EU. The big shareholder companies like the CBI, Sands and I in the UK. But the entrepreneurs are more skeptical. Yes, I agree. Self made, people who run their own businesses like Anthony Bamford, who yeah. wrote the big article, mm -hmm. uh, big self made entrepreneur, Grevskogsbranche, or Grevskogsbranche, uh, are more, I would say, EU reformers. Yeah. So you have a split, I would say, in business. I would agree, but to clarify, I would say there's a, there's a split there even amongst entrepreneurs, because obviously if you're an entrepreneur and you run a business relying on the EU, you would be. But what I would say is you're absolutely right that most of them, those big shareholder businesses, but those those big shareholder businesses are the big business that give money to the Conservative Party exactly. or support the Conservative Party. And create a lot of jobs. And create a lot of jobs. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is from a talk from the Tories' political positioning, it's very difficult for them to say to the banks, don't worry, we've got this covered, and then go, by the way, we're getting out. It would just be very politically tricky for them. Yeah. I think in terms of immigration as well, like, I mean, I you're right that obviously it puts a lot of stress on local services with a large influx of immigrants, but that's not really what the debate's been about. I mean, it's been about benefits, for example, which is no, you know, it's, it's nothing uh, for immigrants, and that's what the entire, uh, well, a lot of the EU reforms are about, it's about benefits to immigrants, which isn't really an issue. Uh, in terms of uh, economics, yeah, in the UK. That's what I mean. I don't know. In Sweden, you can make a, a big case for it, but definitely not in the in the UK. Um, and it's but it's interesting as well because when you talk about that sort of sector of uh, society that might vote for you, people might be uh, affected by immigration in terms of maybe wages. Uh, 
there's, I mean, they are very heavily um, affected by, for example, um, cuts in, in welfare, sure. and so it's a little bit strange. But, I mean, they don't necessarily vote Tory; they would vote Labour instead. But it doesn't seem like the best solution to their problems will be to cut immigration. I agree. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, personally, yeah. I agree. But, but I think also what plays into this is that London is so different from the rest of the UK because yeah. London is, if you take away London from the UK, the GDP per capita is like Portugal in the UK. So, and London is, you know, it, it's more than a, it's a city state in almost the traditional Greek sense, like Athens or Sparta. It has its own values, yeah. systems, it has its own population. Half of us who live in London weren't born there or come from other countries. 380 languages, 180 nationalities. It's it's like Athens in in 300 BC. You know, it's like Rome was um, something that is entirely new. That's not entirely part of the UK, and it's almost like the capital of Europe. At least the financial. And I think London would lose that position if it left yes. the EU. Definitely, I agree. It would yeah. be hugely detrimental to the UK. Well, I think, I mean, I think that actually on the immigration question as well, there is such a London rest of the country split as well, because London gets the majority of the immigration in terms of headcount, but what London tends to get is, you know, we get like the, the sort of smartest, most entrepreneurial French people who come to London to say, when do you go? Great! But yeah. so Campbell's mother was a Jamaican immigrant. She yeah. wasn't a, a banker. You no, know. true. No, no, no. Absolutely. So you absolutely. A lot of people coming. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Who have been lovely. I think we have a question from the audience here. Uh, um, what do you think is um, uh, in the long term uh, a successful strategy for uh, the UK? No, no, for the Conservatives to take back the voters. Um, uh, from uh, UK, um, um, uh, uh, I mean, is there is there another way than to be uh, populist uh, than? Uh, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Do you want me? I, I can come in on that. Yeah. What I would say is, if I was you know sitting at Bill Bank saying, oh, what should we do? I'd say, let's not bother. Just. Forget about it, because the Tories can't get these people back. They can't get them back for a couple reasons. One, to try and satisfy these people would alienate whole groups of other people who vote Tory. Second of all, yeah, I mean, four million is a lot, but actually the problem is you have to understand that a lot of those people came, used to, they didn't used to vote Tory, as you can see from this election, they used to vote Lib Dem. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense, because how does this work? There are so many Lib Dem to UKIP switches at this election, loads. I don't know how many people, if you did phone call like at Lib Dem wow. HQ, you know how many people said, yeah, vote new kid. It was huge. Because, because, and this, this is why, because so many people, and I'm saying this as a Liberal Democrat, and it's quite sad that this is the case, but this is the case, a lot of people used to vote Lib Dem as a protest vote. So it was basically, screw the, all those guys, I don't want any of you in there, I'm just going to have a vote against the whole system. And UKIP, that's what UKIP is about. And it's not about, as you can see, it's not about value systems at all. It's just literally about... So I would say, look, the Tories can never get people who want to rebel against the system because the Tories are the system. Like they are, you do not get much more establishment than the Conservative Party of Great Britain. I mean, it's like it's the establishment sort of thing. So they'll never get those people back. Instead, focus. So you look at the Lib Dems. Why do all those people vote Lib Dem? Where with the Lib Dem core vote is about eight eight percent. Why can't the Tories get those people? That's what I'm being ruthless about it. And I'm saying that as Lib Dem, by the way. That's what I'm. That's what I'm looking at. I did a story on that last week yeah. about the myth mm. of UK voters yeah. coming from the Tories. Yeah. I looked at eight or ten different constituencies where you clearly could see mm. leave them to UK. Yeah. Six thousand plus, six thousand plus. Yeah. They might have taken a detour over the labor battle. You can see it sure, but yeah. it's it happens so much that you have to notice a pattern somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think that's the whole story. I mean, I don't know. I, I, mean, yeah. I, I was actually wondering how much of the, because there is clearly a pattern about how much of them have actually yeah. taken that detour. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, the student vote, for example, wouldn't go UK. No, of course. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. Um, but also, it's, I mean, coming back to, to Labour, it's Labour that has a problem, really. Mm. And I don't think those voters, I mean, to some extent, protest vote as well, but to some yeah. extent, actually. Um, Concerned about their situation, where there isn't any sort of hope or any sort of—I mean, there is, there isn't, yeah. there aren't any opportunities at all. And I don't think yeah. that's 
Um, yeah, so the Tories might not have to worry about that because they're going to win those votes anyway. But Labour definitely yeah. has. Labour definitely yeah. have to worry about it. Well, the Tories just got a majority, so. <laughs> they don't need to get a huge amount of extra votes, particularly to keep winning. Um, Labour, yeah, they're going to have a big problem because how do they get those UKIP voters back, essentially, without alienating, for instance, London, which is a very un-UKIP city. You know, UKIP do very, very badly in London for obvious reasons. You know, London is, as you say, has its own complete value system, which is totally, uh, is, is the opposite of UKIP in lots of ways. So, so how do you appeal to these UKIP switchers and London? Which is, to keep in mind, is one of Labour's remaining heartlands. It seems like it goes kind of hand in hand with this more turn to identity, yeah. uh, which which changes the changes the debate yeah. in favour of the EU and immigration issues. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like a good strategy for Labour to sort of just reinforce that. Image. Yes. Um, yeah. And it, it's strange why it should be so hard because if you look at, I mean, if you look at Rotherham, which is south side yeah. where I live, um, there. There are so many issues there, welfare mm -hmm. issues, yep. for example, and, and, and uh, labour market issues yep. that affect people's lives, which labour should really be able to do, especially after five years of Tory government. Yep. Uh, and it's just very, very strange that they're not able to, to do that, actually. I think you hit the nail on the head. They need to have their own narrative. They need to say, look, your problems are not being caused by immigration. We can fix them in the following ways. Because if they keep talking in the same language as you can, People will go, well, I don't really believe you. Labour let all these people in. You know, that's the narrative that people have about Labour. I'm just going to vote you can. I mean, as long as they keep reinforcing that message, I think it's entirely to the detriment. Is that? Oh, sorry. We have, what we have in the UK, which is different from Sweden also, is that we have a very aggressive trade union. Oh. Uh, Unite, which is sort of like, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it in terms of spelling out the terms and conditions, who do we want to support, what are our terms and conditions, and having a, a, a chairman who, who, who is the opposite of the word charm, I would say. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lev McCluskey, McCluskey. Uh, um, who basically says, I can't support him because he's an asshole, I can't support her because she's right wing, that candidate should yeah. do more blah blah blah. Uh, and he just attracts voter. You know, every time yeah. he opens every his time mouth, he speaks, yeah. people just stream to the centre right side because yeah. he's showing mind that he doesn't really have that sort of belongs to an old world rather than being progressive and globalized. Well I think that's that, a huge difference. I think it's a huge I mean one of the big problems is is, is looking at for instance looking at Sweden yeah. where an actual fact the unions have more power, but that's the whole point. In other because words they're progressive and modern exactly. and, and, and work together with the companies. Exactly. But yeah. the problem is you don't have the unions are far actually far less powerful in Britain. And so as a result they try to exercise it all through one vehicle, which is the Labour Party. Which as you say just continuously it's like they would rather have the Labour Party not in power, but in their control, than them to be in power and the unions. So it, it's it, it's gone completely crazy now. I mean, they, they used to be at least a bit more subtle. You know, you used to know if you if you knew what was going on in politics, you knew all oh, the unions. And things like that. Now they're just overt about it. They just go. They've said, uh, "Oh, Andy Burnham's our guy. If we don't get Andy Burnham, we're going to leave the Labour Party." I'm like, how can you? What are you thinking? Saying that in public? It's 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 just so. As you say, you can just. Feel, you can almost, when you read it, you can almost feel the votes sitting, <laughs> sitting away from the Labour Party. I mean, it's crazy. So guys, we're about to round off. I would wonder if you have any sort of final reflections, ideas, questions for the future about UK politics. Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can volunteer. Okay. I, I think the most important thing is actually not about the political parties, but it's about uh, keeping Britain as a free trading beacon uh, of the world. Uh, and um, I think that's going to be the most important thing now with the EU negotiations. And, and that role, if we look at what means something to Sweden, it's Britain's role in the EU as a free trade beacon and it's inter uh, Britain's role in NATO. Uh, in terms of the problems we are facing with Putin. So that's actually, if we look at what's important to Sweden, these are the two key issues. And, and I, that's what I'm going to be watching, because the rest is just internal in a way. Right. Uh, and uh, in terms of free trade and in terms of Britain's role in NATO, I think uh, David Cameron is uh, trustworthy. I also hope he can get his party along on, on the EU issue. That's and I'm 
for myself being a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will spend at least one, maybe two years more mm -hmm. in Britain, and I expect a lot more mm -hmm. visits from the journalist, journalistic equivalent of Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, very good and very important stories, especially, of course, the referendum. Yeah. I'm not so... I'm, if the referendum was tomorrow, Britain would say, yeah, but what happens in two years? Mm. You don't know, because referendums sure. tend to have their own sort of maybe momentum that something could happen a week before, yeah. maybe, or something. So it's not a done deal. The first thing I'm going to do soon is find for British citizenship, because you never really know, it might be a gamble if, uh, um, if uh, we do leave. But <laughs> I'll say I will be part of the we. <laughs> That's where we're at. Um, but no, I think that, that what we may be interested in immigration issues as well, that the, the main thing is to kind of move away from this identity, polit identity politics and move more towards uh, ideological politics. And also to do it with a little bit more sort of optimism. Uh, and actually have, and I have a great quote from one of the um, one people I talked about when I went to Rotherham just for, to write an article. Um, there was this uh, woman who I think she might have voted BNP, I'm not quite sure, it must have been BNP or UKIP. Yeah. Um, but she said, if it's a hung parliament, make sure you hung, hang them all. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of summed up by the entire sort of mood, um, yeah. which is not very nice. So maybe more positive right. campaigning. <laughs> I mean, I would probably, uh, well, I'll just focus on some of the things you guys said. I mean, I think that, I see what you mean about it being the macro picture. I mean, I think that uh, there, uh, a lot does depend on how Cameron handles his party, how they stick together, if they fray, if there's lots of rebellions. And I'm sort of in a strange boat as a liberal, sort of hoping that they kind of rebel on the right thing, <laughs> stay together on the other, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's why I'm not a Tory, basically. Because, <laughs> I agree with them on some things and vastly disagree with them on others. Um, so, so that puts me in a slightly difficult position. In terms of the EU referendum, and I, I, mean, I know you're right that probably one can say, well, if we voted um, tomorrow, we'd probably stay in, but don't know what happens in two years. I'd probably, I'm, I'm <laughs> part of my uh, optimism about staying in uh, is the British are very small C conservative, and any attempts to try and change the status quo is very difficult. We saw that with the Scottish referendum. I mean, no matter what happens, there's just there's more people who go, I'm going to stick with what we know. I'm just going to that's I'm just going to do that. And I think that um, if if staying is ahead, although narrowly now, I think after you have everybody weigh in and the Commonwealth thing's been totally dashed to the rocks and. The U.S. president, the final PPP will be the you know U.S. president going like I want everyone to stay. Uh, Britain must stay part of the European Union. <laughs> no, people just go, oh, yeah, that's it, that's it. That's, that's what I personally think. I mean, again, what I would stress is if you're pro-European, you, we cannot be complacent. We cannot go, oh, well, this is in the bag. We need to, we need to fight it <laughs> as much as possible. But by the same token, I, I remain uh, hopeful. And yeah. So I was talking a bit fearful and then a bit hopeful. That's very possible. Well, there, there you go. Thanks so much, Nick. And thanks uh, the whole audience for coming here. Uh, we still have some drinks and some food left over, so do take a moment to uh, mingle. Perhaps you want to take a uh, um, uh, question uh, one of the panelists or our speaker for tonight. Also at the entrance, you will find uh, pamphlets, um, books, and reports from the Olin Institute and a contact list if you want to stay in touch. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to say thank you so very much to the whole panel and especially to you, Nick, for coming here. We do have a small gift for you guys. Oh.